Our topic is human metabolism. We are going to look at the chemistry involved in this biological process. So what is human metabolism? Human metabolism is a series of interdependent organic reactions that break down food molecules to provide energy, specifically known as aerobic cellular respiration. We break down carbohydrates into glucose molecules, then use glucose to produce ATP. Basically, we are taking compounds with potential energy and converting it into a usable form, which is ATP. ATP is our body's energy currency. There are three steps in cellular respiration. Glycolysis, breaking down glucose molecules from carbs into molecules that enter the next cycle, specifically pyruvate. In the Krebs cycle, pyruvate turns into another compound, namely acetyl-CoA, which gets completely oxidized by a series of steps catalyzed by enzymes. Glycolysis and the Krebs cycle produce a few ATP. The last step, which is the electron transport chain, is where the majority of ATP is formed. It does this by producing a chemical gradient with products from glycolysis in the Krebs cycle to power enzymes that synthesize ATP. The first connection is looking at the energy changes that take place during the process of metabolism. The thermodynamics and thermochemistry behind metabolism is analyzed. First, we are going to look at thermochemistry, which is the study of energy involved in a specific chemical reaction. The following is the balanced chemical equation for cellular respiration. As you can see, metabolism is an exothermic reaction because there is a net release of energy. Energy is a product in this equation. Like the past reactions we have studied in class, there is an enthalpy change that is associated with metabolism, specifically the enthalpy of glucose. The value of this is negative 2,870 kilojoules per mole under standard lab conditions and negative 3,012 kilojoules per mole in a cell. The enthalpy change values are negative because energy is released. Next, we are going to look at thermodynamics. We know that the law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So then how can we explain where the energy comes from in the end of metabolism? Energy must be transferred. The human body has certain energy transfer mechanisms, the first of which is substrate level phosphorylation where ATP is directly formed. As you can see, ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, takes a phosphate group directly and turns into ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. The second mechanism is oxidative phosphorylation, where ATP is formed through a series of redox reactions where oxygen is a final electron acceptor. The formation of ATP, ATP here takes place in the final stage of metabolism, which is the electron transport chain. The oxygen, because of its high electronegativity, is the final electron acceptor. The next connection is between metabolism and rates of chemical reactions. How is the rate of human metabolism controlled? First, we must consider why we need to control the rate of reaction at all. Glucose doesn't react readily with oxygen. If it did, a lot of excess waste, namely carbon dioxide and water, and energy would be created considering the amount of oxygen available in the air that we breathe in. Something has to regulate the rate of metabolism so that this doesn't happen. This is why we need activation energies and specific enzymes to help regulate the rate of reaction for metabolism. Activation energy is the minimum collision energy required for a successful reaction. Glucose has a high activation energy. This is to prevent the spontaneous combustion described before. Oxygen does not have the electronegativity to break the bonds of glucose simply by bumping into it. Without this activation energy, glucose would convert too quickly into water, carbon dioxide, and energy. In this graph, the bump is the activation energy which is labeled EA. The reaction cannot continue unless that amount of energy is present. If it wasn't, reactants don't form products. Specific enzymes is the second mechanism used to regulate metabolic rate. To understand how enzymes work, consider how a catalyst works to speed up a re reaction. Catalysts speed up rates of reaction by lowering activation energy, and enzymes are biological catalysts. Enzymes are very specific, they cannot work with any compound and lower just any activation energy for any reaction. Instead, each enzyme has a unique substrate, which is the reactant molecule which the enzyme binds to. Each step of metabolism is catalyzed by a specific enzyme. This model is the lock and key model of how enzymes and substrates may interact with each other. 
The enzyme contains the lock, which is known as the active site, with a specific shape that fits with the key of the corresponding substrate. The active site is located on the enzyme, and together they make the enzyme-substrate complex. This next connection studies the relationship between the functional groups and the bonds in the essential organic compounds involved in human metabolism. So what makes up these essential compounds? Well, different functional groups do, of course. There are many different functional groups present in organic compounds. We will be focusing on the functional groups present in the nutrients essential to metabolism. Those are lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. What bonds do the essential compounds have? Covalent bonds, which, as the diagram indicates, is the sharing of electrons between two elements. They also have ionic bonds, which is the transfer of electrons between two elements. And lastly, there are hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are strong intermolecular forces of attraction between hydrogen atoms and highly electronegative elements, such as oxygen. The first essential nutrient we will be discussing is proteins. Proteins are vital to metabolism because the enzymes that carry out metabolism are proteins. The base unit of a protein is an amino acid. This is made up of a carboxyl or ester compound, a hydrogen, an amine compound, and an R group. There are 20 different R groups, which allow for 20 different amino acids to be formed. This also allows for proteins to be created because they use amino acids as building blocks. The primary structure of a protein is a chain of amino acids linked together by peptide bonds. A peptide bond is created via condensation reactions, and they are covalent. A secondary structure is then formed when hydrogen bonds form between the nearby amino acids in the primary structure. They either fold into a sheet, such as like the lower image, which is called the beta pleated sheet, or they coil, like the top image, into an alpha helix. Next, a tertiary structure is formed by further folding the primary structure. Hydrogen bonds, disulfide bridges, which are covalent bonds, and ionic bonds stabilize the structure. The next nutrient we will be discussing is a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates, specifically glucose, fuel metabolism. Glucose, which is the image shown, is present in glycolysis, the first stage of metabolism. The functional groups present in glucose are aldehyde and alcohol compounds. This is a linear form of glucose. However, it is also found in a circular form. These circular forms can bond together through condensation reactions, and they form covalent bonds, which link them together. Lastly, we will discuss fats. Fats are important in metabolism because they can store the energy either needed by metabolism or created by it. Let's first look at fatty acids. They are made of carboxylic acid and a hydrocarbon tail. These two images are identical, except that the image on the right has a double bond between two carbon atoms. This creates a bend in the fatty acid. Three fatty acids, along with a glycerol molecule, form a triglyceride. To create a triglyceride, a bond between the three fatty acids and the glycerol must be created. The bond form is an ester linkage. This link is the removal of water formed by the hydroxyl group of the glycerol and the carboxyl group of the fatty acid. Oxidation and reduction reactions. How are redox reactions involved in metabolism? In order for metabolism to take place, energy must be harnessed by the body. This is done via redox reactions. Redox reactions are chemical reactions that involve a reduction and an oxidization reaction. A reduction reaction is when a reactant gains an electron. This reactant is called the oxidizing agent. An oxidation reaction is when a reactant loses an electron. This reactant is called the reducing agent. In metabolism, NAD plus and NADH is harnessed in all stages. The reduction reaction is going from NAD plus to NADH, and the oxidation reaction is going from NADH to NAD plus. Antioxidants. Antioxidants are chemical compounds that deactivate dangerous byproducts of metabolism. These byproducts are called free radicals. Free radicals can cause damage to membranes and DNA. Antioxidants inhibit the oxidation of other other molecules. In doing so, they preserve important molecules needed in metabolism. The fifth connection is the application of Le Chatelier's principle to blood. Metabolism involves the transportation of energy throughout the human body. Blood is the body's transportation system that moves the products and reactants of metabolism around the body. Without blood, metabolism would not take place. Blood, however, is very sensitive to changes in pH levels. 
In order to resist changes to the pH, blood has a buffer system. Buffers are conjugate acid-base pairs. The buffer in blood is carbonic acid and a bicarbonate pair. When, C when carbon dioxide reacts with water, carbonic acid is formed. However, because it is unstable, it ionizes to form bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. How can we apply Le Chatelier's principle to, the, to blood? Well, as we know, Le Chatelier's principle states that a dynamic equilibrium tends to respond so as to relieve the effects of any change in the conditions that affect the equilibrium. When an imbalance occurs, we can use Le Chatelier's principle to predict the response the body will have. In the example, there is an increase in carbon dioxide. This will lead to an increase in carbonic acid, which will then lead to an increase in bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. In doing this, it will re-establish equilibrium. The same goes for the second example, but in the opposite direction. The following connection studies acids in metabolism. How are acids related to this process anyway? First, we must understand which acids are involved. One example is carbonic acid. Recall the chemical equation for cellular respiration. Let's just focus on the products carbon dioxide and water. Simply put, these two products eventually turn into carbonic acid, which ionizes to form a salt and hydrogen ions. We know that carbonic acid is a weak acid, and it has an equilibrium constant of 4.3 times 10 to the negative 7. So a better chemical equation would be where hydronium is formed. We know that a high concentration of hydronium produces a lower pH. Cellular respiration can also result in the production of lactic acid. The runner in this picture is feeling fatigue in soreness in his muscles because of the buildup of lactic acid. This chemical equation illustrates lactic acid and its ion lactate. Lactic acid is a weak acid, and its equilibrium constant is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 4. Because pH is generally higher than pKa in the body, most of lactic acid is dissociated and is present in the form of lactate. So how does lactic acid form? Our body forms lactic acid by a process known as lactic acid fermentation. NAD gets oxidized and becomes NADH in glycolysis, turning pyruvate into lactate rather than going through pyruvate oxidation. This happens because there isn't enough oxygen in the body. In other words, when oxygen levels are low, pyruvate converts to lactic acid. When oxygen levels are adequate, lactic acid converts to pyruvate.